all those rules are made to be broken. And what role does innovation orig originality have in a style that seems to be so consistent and specific? Can we still see originality, or is it in some way compromised by the parameters of geometric abstraction? And how important is the way the work is made and what its condition is in? In other words, how does it look? Does it still look crisp? These are works which are enormously demanding. Mondrian, who was a great father figure, and we'll look at his work in just one second, but before we do, we'll look at a couple of other things. But Mondrian's works have enormous cracks in the surface of them. And in fact, I know I had a friend who was trying to buy a Mondrian. He asked my opinion about this particular painting. And we know sometimes that the Mondrians, which are in very good condition, have actually been physically repainted. Because there was a tremendous amount of what we call, this sounds sort of esoteric, but it isn't actually, a paint separation. The white passages of Mondrian paintings have cracks in them. And sometimes those are the paintings that, in a sense, are more valuable because there's more of the artist's hand left on that work than a work that might have great flatness. So there are fascinating issues that happen with geometric abstraction because we have high levels of what we consider perfection or what, how well that object should be done, which are very forgive, forgiven in more expressionist and gestural work. One doesn't worry so much about a crack in a Monet as one worries about a crack in a Mondrian. Now, the city was very important for all of these geometric artists. And I just show you in passing two manifestations of how the city impacted and works. We see a Leger painting from 1918 called The City, one of the great paintings by the French painter Leger. More abstract and more kind of, there's a kind of cacophony. But as you look at it, you make, you, you can see the, the figures on the stairs that are climbing up and down. You don't see them right away. They become sort of mechanical. But suddenly, you begin to see how their figures, which have been expressed in a very geometric way. On the other side of the screen is a work you've never seen, but I think it's one of the masterpieces of geometric abstraction. And it is a sculpture by an artist named John Storrs, an American who, like so many of the great artists in America, and I think a share of the artists in Argentina have often gone to Paris, especially in the early years of the 20th century, because they had to go to where art was being made at its best. And this is a skyscraper motif from the early 1920s by John Storrs. An artist, again, you've never heard of, but he could be, in fact, one of the most interesting artists working in that way in the 20th century. Now another utterly key figure is a Russian painter named Malevich. And here we see two examples of Malevich's work. The work that has a kind of cross-like and therefore a slightly religious feeling to it, though I think it is really a geometric abstraction and not a religious geometric abstraction, is furthest from me. It was done around 1924. And the more complex work was actually done in 1918. But you can see already he was doing what I would call idiosyncratic, personal geometric abstraction. There was a system there, but the system was very instinctual. And the fact that he could manipulate things so instinctually and yet still be a geometric artist is, I think, part of the extraordinary power of his work. But now we see what I think is the sort of overriding parental figure of geometric abstraction. And that is the work of Piet Mondrian, a Dutch artist who then, because he was fleeing the rise of, of Nazism and the Germans, he, fl he fled to London. He had a period in London where he made very good paintings. And his paintings, in a sense, became simplified in London. Then he came to New York, and he made a work which is very famously called Broadway, like the great street in New York, Boogie Woogie. Um, and I just was looking out at a friend in the audience, and she could mimic those words, because this is a, an icon. This is an incredibly famous painting by this artist. And it has all the features which uh, really identify geometric abstraction, and yet it has tremendous eccentricity to it. But the primary palette of these colors is what, again, has made Mondrian so important, that he uses red, blue, yellow, white, and black. And he does it in a very rigorous way. And that's what makes so, so radical some of the later works that Joe was just talking about, because he has said they're suddenly using a palette, a range of colors, which wasn't possible before. But think of these two works as we look at the next sequence of slides, because you will see the phenomenal impact of this particular uh, person on the field of how you could paint a geometric abstract art. There was no way that the artists who were emerging could ever for forget this man because he was so important in their work. He was such a, a primal figure in helping them understand what a painting could be that worked in this mode. So we see now an homage to the work by the American artist Leon Polk Smith on one side of the work. And it's called, in fact, Homage to Broadway 
boogie boogie, boogie woogie, excuse me. And um, on the other side, a work by an artist who was not living in New York City, not involved with the tremendous energies of, of city life, but actually living in Minnesota, the very Midwestern part of America, named Charles Biederman. And it, this is his homage to um, a work. Wonderful artist, less well known, and very indicative to us of the extraordinary discoveries which are still possible amongst this remarkable group of geometric abstract artists. And as we move on, we see a work which we've just seen before, two works by Millet, this wonderful artist who again had a powerful experience with the work of Mondrian and going to Paris. One thing I'll point out to you that Joe didn't point out because it's, it was so obvious to him, but it's really worth pointing out, I think, is that actually this work is a relief. It is a built-up sculptural work. It takes the painting ideas and really moves them into something that becomes constructed. And then the work that is furthest from me is the early work. And I think already, those of you who maybe had never seen a Mondrian before or thought about geometric abstraction for very much would sense that is the first work this artist would make. And then he would have the freedom to make the later work, which was just a matter of years later. But he couldn't do it until he'd really made his Mondrian, as it were. Now, a work by a British artist named Ben Nicholson, very well known for the curves and sort of sinuous qualities of his work. But at this particular stage in his work, between 1940 and 43, made a fantastic homage to Mondrian, even closer. Next to it, a painter who's become enormously famous, probably of the artists who work in a geometric abstract way, working in the United States. I think he is the most, single most respected artist for whatever reason. His name is Ellsworth Kelly. He was working in Paris on what is called in America the GI Bill. This was the bill that was passed by our government that would allow people who fought in the Second World War to travel wherever they wanted to travel and continue their education, which had been broken usually by having to go off and fight in the war. So he, he chose to go back to Paris and to make up, it's 12 feet long, this painting, and it's a wall done in 1950, 51, which he called Color Wall. It's sort of an amazingly radical painting for that moment, but using the ideas of Mondrian in a way that was very fresh and, of course, a much more varied palette. But again, we'll now look at more of the sort of children of Mondrian, effectively. And I'm not even going to give you names because it's just too confusing. I mean, I'll say in the upper corner is a work by a man named Joseph Albers, who anyone who's interested in geometric abstraction, this is a, a, a very key person. If Mondrian is God, Albers is one of the best saints of this particular religion because he developed a whole col color theory and he taught at an important American university, Yale University, for many, many years and influenced a tremendous range of artists who might have worked in totally different ways but learned the extraordinary dedication he felt. And if I was to make the list of the conditions of what, it, what are the range of geometric abstraction, there's one more that I really wish I could add. Obsessive and more obsessive. So geometric abstraction is about being incredibly compulsive. And then the, the range of it is to be even more incredibly compulsive. Um, so that's, I think, an important thing to keep in mind that I should have mentioned earlier. But again, the black and white palette, the delimited palette, so you could think about formal issues. Next, we have variations on the theme of Mondrian, which get sort of loosen things up a bit. But again, works that are done early on. A 1951 work, furthest from me, and then the same work by Ilya Balatovsky, where he breaks the big rule in Mondrian, which is curves. Mondrian said, curves are simply too emotional. I can't deal with curves. And in Ellsworth Kelly's case, and he's, not, he's, he's an artist I've studied very much, you can usually tell a little bit about Ellsworth's biography from his paintings. When he paints his paintings with circles, he gets very mad at me when I've told him this, he is having a love affair. When he is having a little trouble in his love life, it gets quite rigid, straight, broken up, kind of like the prison. So when you see a curve, think love affair. <laughs> now, simple geometry is, a, is such a feature of these artists' works. And we've already seen these examples, but just think about the simple geometry, because as artists were moving away from Mondrian, they remained simple. I, I don't want to make it too, too, sort of a, too much of a generalization, but essentially we see a growing complexity. And this was very obvious, and it became more obvious to me in the brilliant way that Joe put this exhibition together. So this growing kind of complexity is a very big issue. And also to say, could we necessarily think that the four squares, the two red, the two white, was made by a Frenchman 
whereas the work on the other side was made by somebody in California. Can we ever see these kinds of relationships? Is there a little more elan, style, joie de vivre, whatever, in the French work and then something, I don't know, uh, what is the California tendency of the work on the other side? I'm not exactly certain, um, <laughs> because we always think of California as being very freeform, but maybe it's like the grid uh, of, some, of some place. But both of these artists are made, were, were, these works are made about the same time in different countries under somewhat different circumstances. Now we see the way the Mondrian, I mean, the Mondrian ideas really get broken up into truly more sculptural shapes, where really you're breaking apart what is happening in the painting. That it is a Mondrian, but it's a deconstructed Mondrian. The Mondrian is being really truly loosened up. And this process continues, of course, in the work of Sarah Morris. I couldn't resist showing you the building the Sarah Morris is based on. This is the LA so Sony building. And I quickly went back to my hotel room and Googled Sony. But when I did it, the building that came up much more regularly was the building that was done for Sony in New York by Philip Johnson. Those of you who know architecture, and I know there's at least one person in the audience who knows a lot about architecture, much more than I do. In any event, that bottom Im image is Philip Johnson's post-modern Sony building. And this is something that Susan, Mar Susan would have known, excuse me, this artist Sarah Morris would have known this because she's a New Yorker, she's very sophisticated. And it's the, much the most famous of Sony's buildings, the building at the bottom. Because Philip Johnson did this totally wacky thing. He took the conventional modern building and he added that design element at the top. People went berserk. They just couldn't believe he could violate the canon of modernism by making that little ornament. It now looks so innocent to us that we think, how could this have been controversial? It was wildly controversial. But in any event, she didn't choose that Sony building, made by a great modernist, made by the man who made his famous glass house in 1948 for himself, worked, working from the ideas of Mies van der Rohe. He then sort of repudiates that by making this postmodern building, but now we're really back to modernism. And suddenly, as I looked at these three images, I began to realize one of the reasons, I think, for the revival of geometric abstraction that has occurred for this generation of artists is that no longer are people feeling as if they have to be postmodern. They can be comfortable about being modern once again. The postmodern idea, which looked so huge for about six and a half years, or six years and two months or something, suddenly wasn't as important, and one could return to modernism. Now, We'll just cycle through these images very quickly, but we see this wonderful, wonderful works, which are what I call the idiosyncratic, the personal adoptions of, um, of geometric abstraction, where you see these three artists work, and they're all working at an earlier moment, all in different places in the world, um, and yet they're, they're, they're breaking apart, they're deconstructing the parental figure, and something sort of like some psychological tale is here of like how does the person grow up and really tries to get beyond their parents. So it's a phase that some of you who are a little bit younger, maybe you're still in it. I, I'm actually 64 years old. I'm still in it um, with my mother, but that's another story. Um, in any event, these are images which break the bonds of, of Mondrian and loosen up things. And they, of course, in a certain sense, pick up on Malevich as well and the kind of freedom which Malevich allowed himself. Now just a group of images and one sized very poorly, but the way you could make an extraordinary statement in a kind of monochrome, in a very limited palette. So we see Stankiewicz's work again, and then we see, I'm sorry, I didn't size it properly, but it's a work by a wonderful artist named Agnes Martin, who uses the geometric principles in her work, but in a, in a highly meditative, highly mental, highly zen way, if you will. And her works are six feet by six feet. So you can see, I didn't do a very good job sizing this image. Um, and please, Agnes, forgive me. Um, she's up there, and she probably would be having a lightning bolt hit me right now, because she was very spiritual, very special uh, kind of a creature, and she lived in New Mexico, and she you know, sort of meditated a lot, and she made these fantastic paintings, which are, as I say, the kind of meditative side of abstract expression, of, of geometric abstraction. Now, the idea that a simple line, something that would say, how could you bring much range to what you could do, and simp uh, simply a, a ribbon of color or a ribbon of form, how much range that has. And again, you've seen two of these images before. I show you a third work by a very interesting German artist named Mach, who was obviously looking a little bit at some of the South American artists, particularly Julio Park and others, in terms of 
the metalwork, or there was a kind of dialogue between them because they used new materials, as Joe described so eloquently in his remarks. But the tremendous range that's possible. Now, the child who one has trouble sometimes accepting in terms of geometric abstraction is the child, really the, the ultimate child. And we see Solowit on one side and further from me, Donald Judd. To me, in my reading of art history, and at this point Joe is stabbing me with a very, very sharp knife, in my reading of geometric abstraction, the final statement of geometric abstraction in many ways is minimalism. But in a sense, it's sort of geometric abstraction gone wrong or gone too far, effectively. But in any event, I, I need you to look at it because it is part of the picture, and it shows how powerful these impulses were and a certain kind of a, a final point they reached. And this is kind of the point that Philip Johnson reached, where he suddenly said, I can't do any more with modernism. I have to ornament it. I have to find ways to make it more personal, to make it something that can, can convey my feelings as opposed to the simple grid that happens. But these artists were still at that particular stage. Donald Judd with a two-toned two work, and it, it kind of can look as if it's a flat top, but actually that space that you're looking at, the inner lining of the square is done in a very powerfully different color. But now let's go back and look at a work which we saw a little bit earlier, the Ken Noland, in a context with an artist who's from South America, and to really talk about how rich the dialogue was amongst these artists, and yet how distinctive their forms are. That when we see this cutout painting, and it's, it's a painting, the, the triangle against white, with the Kenneth Nolan, which is in the upper corner, that's an early work by that artist who makes the shaped canvas below it. So these artists work within this vocabulary of form, but find ways. They even use some of the same kinds of colors in their work from painting to painting, but it, it carries itself forward. We're beginning to see the kind of complexity building into the work and what the famous postmodernist um, architect Robert Venturi called the complexity and the contradictions that are somehow permissible within this work. This is one of the, the works that is most complex for me to sort of assimilate within the exhibition. It's a work by a man named Alexander Lieberman. He was a Russian, and I'm sure he was extremely conscious of the work of, of, of um, Malevich, but it, it was useful to him in this unbelievably uh, sort of simple, platonically basic work that he made, a whole series of these very geometric and simple works. I compare his work, and, and, it's, and it's connected in this exhibition with the work of Leon Polk Smith. And also here you have a chance to see uh, the work of an artist that I've mentioned before, Ellsworth Kelly, in the blue, green, and red painting of Ellsworth Kelly's, which I think is from 1964. Alongside it, you see one of the most complex works by Leon Polk Smith. I think it's kind of his masterpiece in many ways. And it's incredibly upbeat. It's incredibly affirming, effectively. I think it's very much a representative of its time. It's a series of works which were called constellation, the way they're forms of, of stars and other, other shapes that, um, that cluster, in a way. And I think it, the other thing that, about these two works and looking at these two works and the appeal of both of these artists in our own moment, and Ellsworth Kelly is truly one of the, the biggest artists living artists in the world today. He has a show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which I'll talk about, the, most, the single most important museum in the United States, and at one of the smaller museums in New York, um, the Museum of the, of the Morgan Library. He also just has had shows at the Tate Gallery in London, every museum of modern art, the Stedelijk in Holland, every museum of modern art wants to do a show of Ellsworth Kelly. And I show you alongside it the work of Leon Leon Polk Smith. But I think one reason why these works are so appealing right now is they seem to indicate a world which is orderly, a world which is controlled, and a world which is affirming. And I think we live in actually a world which is kind of the opposite of all these things. And so these are works which I think speak to a moment that now looks very past and yet somehow has contemporaneous qualities because they're fresh, the works, and they're lively, a, work that, a, a world which was well-ordered at that point. Now, before I go on, and I don't have that many more images to show, and I, I, I promise, I wanted to show these three works because the chrysanthemum flower that's on the yellow, who knows who made that work, that drawing? Does anybody know? It's made by Mondrian. Mondrian was, I mean, we speak about people having closet kind of private personalities. He was a closet nature lover, uh, Mondrian. You thought he just liked straight lines. You thought he just liked simple colors. He loved nature. And he made a whole series of these works. 
And some scholars, the scholars of geometric abstraction, his work, say he only made them for money. He made them because there was somebody who was willing to pay him for these drawings, and they wouldn't pay him for the geometric work he was making. Other people said he really made them for himself, and he did, and he had many left at the time of his death. The work in the center is by Leon Polk Smith, who, as I say, it's a flower form. And then this whole exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York is devoted to the flower and plant drawings of Ellsworth Kelly. So that man who made the forms that we, we just saw, those three forms, he is quietly, privately, in his own house uh, and in his own front yard, making these kinds of drawings of plant life. And the sadness of the show at the Met is that they don't really deal mo so more with the, two, the, the, the fact that the geometric abstract works could never have been made unless he had these kinds of ideas and had been able to work them out in the plant drawings. But now, let's just look at a few more works, which, some of which we've seen before, and just ponder what begins to happen, I think, with a great deal of the geometric abstraction. It starts using other kinds of materials. It uses extremely elaborate compositions, and it uses um, a greater degree of complexity. It really becomes richer and richer and richer. And we see that in this series of works. And I'm sorry for some of the sizing of these, because circles have suddenly been turned into ovals. Please forgive me. Um, but at least you get the picture of it. And Joe knows how to do things well, so he had them all the right way. Um, more of these works, which have to do with this complexity. And hopefully, seeing these images will inspire you to go to see the exhibition and to really see these works in real life, because they have tremendous opticality. They, they really are, and that's what op art meant. It was mean, meaning optical art, the extraordinary emer emergence of this movement, which became a kind of second wind or a second or sort of a second chapter, a second act for geometric abstraction, but or maybe a third act for that matter. And at the same time, they become very physical works because you have to really move about them. It's like sculpture. It is, they are three-dimensional, seemingly two-dimensional things. So that process happens, and it becomes more and more exciting in this exhibition as you really begin to ponder these marvelously sort of um, the great velocity, the great speed of these paintings. One of the things that became very clear to me was that a lot of the Argentinians, at least in my interpretation, dealt with what I would call velocity. They dealt with speed. They, de they dealt with works which animated a tremendous amount of activity uh, and, and really physicality. That you could see that the work was asking that really these, there were pulsations to the work. There was an aura to the shapes. Um, and that happens very much in these two works are, are examples of that sense of opticality and auras existing. And another Argentinian with these incredible, this sort of racetrack of one's mind, these, these marvelous tracks and fields of color, and the vividness of this color, which would 